and Robert Gallo called a press conference together that would involve the United States Department of Health in what critics claim would become the biggest medical scientific blunder of all time. First, the probable cause of AIDS has been found, a variant of a known human cancer virus called HLT HTLV-3. With HTLV-3, Gallo's white elephant virus program made the jump from the cause of cancer to become the cause of AIDS and the target of billions of dollars in research funds. Simultaneously, as the press conference was going on, the blood test used to detect HIV was being patented, which would earn the U.S. Department of Health over $100 million a year and large financial kickbacks to Robert Gallo. The AIDS industry was born, and the U.S. government was now fully invested. Naively, Secretary Heckler predicted that a vaccine would be ready for testing by 1986. We hope to have such a vaccine ready for testing in approximately two years. For the moment, everyone was happy about this discovery of the probable cause of AIDS. Gay activists were satisfied that the government was finally doing something. But the public was not aware that Gallo had bypassed a major checkpoint before making his announcement. He had not submitted his test results to other scientists for peer review. No one had a chance to critique or verify his claim and his test results were not published in Science Magazine until one week after the press conference. This was a dangerous violation of scientific protocol. Suddenly, a challenge to Gallo's ethics emerged, which would become an international scandal. The Institut Pasteur in Paris claimed that Gallo's AIDS virus was identical to LAV, a virus Dr. Luc Montagnier had sent Gallo's lab six months before the press conference. The French were outraged and filed an international lawsuit against the U.S. Health Department on grounds that Gallo had pirated their discovery. The entire incident was embarrassing to the United States and had to be resolved diplomatically by President Reagan and Prime Minister Jacques Chirac of France. With this arrangement to split the profits made on the HIV blood test, the virus was given a new international name the human immunodeficiency virus, or HIV. Despite questions of Gallo's character and ethics, HIV had now gained international acceptance. But when Gallo's HIV results were finally published in Science Magazine, only 44 of 93 AIDS patients he tested, that's less than half, had the virus. Yet Gallo claimed that in further studies, he could find HIV in up to 90% of those he tested. As other virologists reproduced Gallo's research, they found similar correlations between HIV and AIDS patients. This high correlation seemed convincing to everyone that HIV must have something to do with causing AIDS. Everyone, that is, except Dr. Peter Duesberg. At the University of California in Berkeley, Duesberg became a world-renowned retrovirologist in the cancer program and the first man to map the genetic structure of retroviruses like HIV back in 1970. His honors include membership in the National Academy of Sciences due to his discovery of cancer-causing genes. Having researched retroviruses for over 30 years, some have called him the world's foremost expert in retrovirology. Dr. Duesberg was somewhat skeptical of Gallo's AIDS virus announcement. I wasn't madly impressed by it because what else would you expect from a person like Gallo who had studied retroviruses all his life that he would say retroviruses is causing AIDS. Yeah. That seemed to me the first coincidence that made me wonder whether that was an authentic claim or going to be an authentic claim but um, I would say uh, it was not a surprise that he would say that he said it before that it would cause leukemia or things like Alzheimer's disease, neurological diseases, and it failed. So I was, one, I was not too impressed that this would, was going to be a winner now. And it would have been for the first time that a retrovirus would have been pinned down as a cause of a human disease or even a disease in wild animals. For 18 months, Peter Duesberg studied every scientific publication on HIV and AIDS he could get a hold of. When he finally published his observations in cancer research in 1987, he stood alone against the tide of popular opinion and the government-funded AIDS industry. His position has become well known. He argues that HIV is not causing AIDS. It's a harmless passenger virus that has lived in humans for centuries without causing diseases. 
He believes AIDS is the result of other non-infectious factors like drug use. And ironically enough, AZT, the highly toxic medication prescribed to treat AIDS patients, actually does what the virus cannot, that is, causes AIDS itself. Though Dr. Duesberg's arguments were ridiculed by many and ignored by most, many of his colleagues studied his research and came to the same conclusion. Something is terribly wrong with the war on AIDS. Dr. Richard Stroman recalls the impact of Duesberg's arguments in cancer research. It was a remarkable review and it raised the fundamental issues about virus, virus, uh, uh, viruses as a cause of both cancer and, and immunosuppression, uh, basic questions that haven't been really responded to in any meaningful way in, in, uh, in the almost 10 years since that paper was published. Soon other top scientists joined Duisberg and Stroman in questioning the HIV hypothesis also. Nobel Prize winners Dr. Walter Gilbert of Harvard and Kerry Mullis who invented the PCR. Dr. Charles Thomas, a former Harvard professor, organized a consortium of 12 signatories to address the issue. They would in time become the group for scientific reappraisal of the HIV AIDS hypothesis. We started out by uh, writing a letter to Nature calling for a reappraisal of the evidence for and against the hypothesis that HIV did in fact do all these things. And um, there were about 10 or 12 signatories to this letter and it was rejected even though many uh, of the signers of the letter were certainly reputable people. We tried Nature magazine and it, it was ignored. And then we tried the New England Journal, JAMA and so forth and Lancet. In each case, we were rejected that they would not publish this letter. It was only four sentences long. It read, um, it is widely believed by the general public that a retrovirus called HIV causes a group of diseases called AIDS. Many biomedical scientists now question this hypothesis. We propose a thorough reappraisal of the existing evidence for and against this hypothesis be conducted by a suitable independent group. We further propose that critical epidemiological studies be devised and undertaken. Now, that is certainly a hardly a bomb-throwing letter, but nonetheless, they would have none of it. And being rejected made us angry, so we decided to extend the list of signatories. So it jumped to 30, and then to 50, and then to 100, and then by 1994, up to 600, 188 of whom have advanced degrees. We publish a newsletter. We have a website. So it's a fairly large organization now. Though the scientific establishment has continually ignored Duisburg and the group for reappraisal, some individuals are having second thoughts. At the San Francisco International AIDS Conference in 1990, Dr. Luc Montagnier, who discovered the virus originally, six months before Gallo's claim, made a startling statement. HIV might be harmless. Against his own interest, Montagnier's statement should have been earth-shaking. But the conventioners paid it little attention and went right on talking about new antiviral drug treatments. Why is the scientific community ignoring the dangerous ramifications of this essential question about the cause of AIDS? Do we have an answer? Yes, in retrospect, we certainly do. Too many people are making too much money out of it. And money is much stronger than truth. If the AIDS establishment will not respond to this issue, then it's time that the public heard the evidence against HIV and demand answers. For the next few minutes, we'll show you why HIV fails as the cause of AIDS and what the real causes could be. We will also explain to you why AIDS is not being caused by conventional sex and why the clean needle and safe sex programs will do little to stop AIDS. You'll have to pay close attention and do some thinking. First, 10 scientific reasons why HIV is not the cause of AIDS. To begin with, let's take a close microscopic look at the virus itself. Number one, HIV, like all other viruses, is harmless after antibody immunity. HIV is a retrovirus. Retroviruses reproduce themselves through a process called reverse transcription. Its receptacle attaches to the coating of the T cell. It penetrates the cell and encodes its RNA genes into the cell's DNA. 
and as the cell multiplies, the new viruses break free and go on to reproduce themselves in other cells.